Don't say bottle babies, Rudy Dack tells himself, though he fears the slang is already imprinted. His wife, Simone, sits in the control seat as always. The car veers into the grounds of the clinic and scrunches along the gravel drive, making Rudy feel anxious on Simone's account. They sweep through a forested perimeter and emerge to see a glass block of a building. Simone turns to him and beams. It's modern. That's a good start, isn't it, he says. The gravel drive, I was worried. <coughs> Rudy knows the gravel drive conjures images of old buildings for Simone. She dislikes old brickwork and iron railings. Smooth red bricks, in particular, drag her down. It's not that her childhood was dire. Her parents were not deliberately neglectful. Yet when she'd left home for her university studies, she couldn't bring herself to return, not even for a brief visit. She left it all behind, her family and their suburban home with its smooth red bricks and black gloss railings. Rudy is the only person who knows about Simone's architectural distastes. He admires her love of all things. She always faces forward. We're due to birth a baby in an hour, says Christina Christophe. So I'll need to break off shortly to meet the parents. Let's take a tour of the wards now. I booked a table for you in our guest restaurant. You can enjoy a le leisurely lunch on my account while I'm overseeing the birth. They follow Dr. Christophe across the atrium in the direction of the gestational wards. There's no point going in the first ward. There isn't much to see there. The fetus you're looking at today is in the third trimester ward. Rudy cringes. He loathes the word fetus, the cold heartlessness of the word, with its intimation that, a, that an ungendered it hasn't as yet earned its passage. Can we see the second trimester ward too, asked Simone. Okay, I'll show you the control room, then after lunch, when you've had time to take his haul in, we'll talk through the family details and your obligations should you decide to go ahead. How does that sound? Just fine. Perfect, says Rudy. He squeezes Simone's hand as they walk with Dr. Christophe along an evenly lit glass wall corridor. The large glass panels are colored in five shades of creamy yellow. Rudy feels he's walking through a dream. So we'll skip this one, she says, pointing at the first trimester ward. Are there any adoptions at this stage of gestation, asks Rudy. In an, ide in an ideal world, he'd like to start the bonding process earlier. He wants to be sure that his bond with the child will be as strong as Simone's. And the sooner he starts, the better. He suspects that women might be quicker at making the emotional attachment, though he doesn't agree that women have more innate caring skills, a notion that seems to persist, annoyingly so. Uh, if a fetus were orphaned at this stage, we'd delay offering it for adoption, says Dr. Christoph. You see, if there's going to be an emergency in this clinic, it's going to be in there. Once the embryonic period is complete, or when most of the fetal body surface responds to touch, we transfer it to the second trimester ward. We aren't rigid. If development is lagging slightly at 12 weeks, we keep the fetus in the first ward for a little longer. She smiles. It's not a production line. After a second silence, Dr. Christoph laughs slightly. What's the failure rate, asks Rudy. Simone pulls a face at him, but he refuses the rebuke. 
While the rate is coming down, the figures are in the public domain, close to single figures now, 8%, give or take. As if on cue, red lights set in the corridor floor begin to flash. There's no audible alarm. Two female medics emerge from a side corridor ahead of them. Dr. Christophe, Simone and Drudy stand aside as they rush past. Side by side, the two medics shoulder through the double doors of the first trimester ward. Don't be alarmed. It's not necessarily an emergency, says Dr. Christophe. They enter an elevator and Dr. Christophe requests the viewing gallery. The lights dim as they ascend. They step out into an even more dimly lit corridor. Dr. Christophe gestures towards the windows that run the entire length. It takes a few seconds for their eyes to adjust. I thought the baby wards would be brightly lit, says Simone. That's only in the marketing material. We don't want the image to look too somber. In reality, as it's dark in a mother's womb, we prefer to create similar conditions without having a total blackout. We all prefer to see the fetuses, the medical staff and the patients. Rudy and Simone gaze down into the second trimester ward. Though at first sight the ward appears to be a tangle of tubes and pulsing monitors, it soon becomes clear that the tangles are set out in a repeating pattern along the length of the, the ward in three rows. In the midst of each tangle sits a tear-shaped bottle that reflects the green data on its overhead monitor. So much equipment and it's so quiet, says Rudy. Well, it would be, says Simone. Dr. Christoph smiles. It seems quiet to us, but it's noisier for the fetuses. We record the mother's and father's voices and feed the sound into the fetus flask during gestation. We follow a natural daily rhythm, no voices during the night, just the sound of a parental heartbeat. Do you switch off the voices if the baby is orphaned? Asked Simone. We haven't had many cases, a handful in five years, so there's no fixed protocol. I try to dissuade the adopting parents from deleting the source parent voices. We have concerns over continuity. You mean the fetus might miss the parents? Not exactly. We feel some aspects of brain development might falter. Oh dear, we don't want to risk that, says Simone. In the case of the fetus you're considering today, the parent is a solo mother. I'd recommend keeping the mother's voice and adding both of yours. Dr. Christoph walks ahead and they follow her along the viewing corridor. With his eyes fixed on the glass bottles, Rudy feels he's watching a time lapse. The sizes of the fetuses increase as Rudy and Simone follow the lineup. They come to a halt near the end of the ward. Directly below them, one male fetus is hugging itself. Rudy has been careful not to give Simone the impression that a boy is his preference. He accepts that a girl would bring equal joy but he suspects he'd prefer messing about with a boy. Then he knows he's being a romantic. There's no guarantee he'd replicate his friendship with Aidan, his godfather. Not that Aidan was physically affectionate. His visits were sporadic. Rudy's closeness to him arose through shared pleasures, tough hikes during which they barely spoke, and they both kept goldfish. Rudy knows that even a biological son might be very different from him. With an adopted child, it would definitely be a matter of chance. 
He tries to push these thoughts aside as he scours the glass bottles, but he can't. Boy, 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 girl, girl, not clear, boy, girl. Thank you.